Welcome. Uh, my name is Keith Bybee. I'm a professor of law and political science, and I'm also director of the Institute for the Study of Judiciary Politics uh, in the Media, or IJPM as we call it. And I'd like to welcome you to a joint production uh, co-sponsored by IJPM and the College of Law's 1L Convocation Series. The Convocation Series is coordinated by uh, Dean Artirian, uh, Dean Harding, and uh, Professor Gould. Uh, IJPM brings a number of speakers to campus every year, and we're always looking for speakers who uh, work at the intersection of law, politics, and the media. The 1L Convocation Series uh, brings speakers to campus that are of general interest to the university community, but of particular interest and benefit to the first year class of law students. And uh, today we have found somebody who more than fulfills the purposes and aspirations of these two speaker series. Uh, our speaker is Joan Biskupic who is a, a very distinguished veteran legal journalist. She is currently editor in charge of legal affairs for Reuters. Uh, she has been Supreme Court correspondent for the Washington Post and USA Today. She is also author of best-selling uh, books, biography of Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, another biography of Antonin Scalia. Uh, and she's uh, widely known for her meticulous uh, reporting uh, her extraordinary uh, access uh, to the judiciary, and really her ability to illuminate and explain uh, the workings of the Supreme Court, uh, which is uh, it's a powerful, influential institution, uh, but many aspects of the court, including the personalities of the justices, are not well known. Uh, and uh, Joan does a really tremendous job. Her reading public is very lucky to have her as a guide. Uh, today, she'll be speaking about her latest book, uh, a copy right here, Breaking in the Rise of Sonia Sotomayor and the Politics of Justice. This book has not yet been published, so how do I have a copy? <laughs> right, interesting question. Because we have made an arrangement for early publication of this book uh, for discussion uh, and sale and signing today. This book will not actually be published until October. Uh, we have a, a book signing that will be held after the lecture today. Uh, there's a table of books that's up top on the first floor, and uh, Joan has agreed to uh, spend time uh, speaking with you and, and signing books. Let me say a few more things about our format today before turning over the podium. Uh, our event will run until 12.50, which will uh, allow time for those of you who need to get to class uh, to get where you need to go. We will also have time after Joan speaks for Q&A, about 10 minutes worth. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll come over to you with a wireless microphone. We ask that you wait until you receive the microphone so that everybody in the hall can hear you, uh, plus so your uh, question can be picked up uh, on the video uh, of this event. Uh, and I encourage you, after the lecture, if you're able, your schedule allows, to stick around for continued conversation with our speaker. Um, and to take a look at her brand new book, which I think promises to be a blockbuster. Please join me in welcoming Joan Scoopin. Thanks, Keith, and thanks to all of you. I should mention that, yes, the book will not officially be out until October 7th. That's when people will actually be able to buy it. Uh, outside of Syracuse. Uh, but I, I also want to mention that as part of the launch, I'm doing three hours on Sunday, October 5th, on C-SPAN. They do uh, this deal where once a month they pick a book and an author to do this in-depth thing. And I just mention it as an aside because uh, you know three hours in the chair and at C-SPAN could uh, get lots of questions on Benghazi and other things, but I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping it might sell books, and I encourage you to even call in that day because you will be a very knowledgeable audience, uh, as opposed to some people who might not have, have had a chance to hear anything about it yet. Uh, but again, thank you, Keith, and thank you, Dean uh, Arterian, and the Institute for the Study of the Judiciary, Politics, and the Media, and the College of Law. The party celebrating the Supreme Court's annual term is an exclusive affair that bears all the trappings of this staid institution and its privileged occupants. I open my book with this because I think it tells you something about the court, and it's one of many vignettes that I want to uh, unspool today as I talk about my latest subject, Sonia Sotomayor. The festivities for this end-of-term party are staged in two ornate rooms that face each other 
across a red carpeted hallway. Oil portraits of the nation's chief justices, all in dark formal garb, line the walls of these rooms. Crystal chandeliers hang from the high gold glazed ceilings. As the end of term party for, the June to, for June 2010 was approaching, Chief Justice John Roberts sent around invitations to the staff. He mentioned the customary platters of hors d'oeuvres and the skits that would be performed by the law clerks. But he also said, he, he reminded invitees that this was a by invitation affair, open only to Supreme Court, full-time Supreme Court employees, not part-time workers, not interns or contractors, which was another sign of the special nature of the event at this elite place. Now, just as Sonia Sotomayor, Bronx-born Puerto Rican, was about to attend her first such party, the nation's first Hispanic justice had joined the Supreme Court the previous August in 2009, an appointee of our first African-American president. I should note here, by the way, that I use the term Hispanic because it refers to um, people who trace their family's origin to the Spanish-speaking countries of Latin America or to Spain. But the term Hispanic and Latino are often used interchangeably by the US Census, by academics, uh, by uh, Justice Sotomayor herself, just to let you know how I'm using the terms. So at this party, after the justices and staff had heaped their plates with food, they took their seats for the entertainment, for these spoofs and parodies that the chief had mentioned in his invitation. Justice Sotomayor sat near the front. So did Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whose husband Martin had just died three days earlier in June 2010 after a very long illness. Ginsburg, a survivor of two serious bouts of cancer herself, had prided herself in not missing a single day of the term. And she had actually been on the bench the day after her husband died. She was exhausted, but she was not about to skip this end of term celebration. Her close friend, Antonin Scalia, always an easy target for the law clerk's parodies because of ex exaggerated mannerisms, secured a spot along the back wall of the room. As the rows of wooden chairs filled quickly, other people began to line the walls too. In the end, about 100 employees were crowded in. Chief Justice Roberts began with the Jeopardy-like trivia contest. And for those of you who don't know how this all works at the court, uh, it, this part is an annual uh, event. There are three clerk teams named Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And they field queries just like you would on Jeopardy, while an aide keeps score on a whiteboard. When that's done, the musical spoofs begin. Now, the law clerks, which as you, who are, as you know, are the young, mostly Ivy League trained attorneys who assist the justices. They assume the roles of the nine, nine members of the bench, and they poke fun at their foibles. The clerks keep these parodies very tame. There are certain expectations of decorum that permeate the marble palace, as it's called. Precedent and consistency are valued in the justices' relationships as well and Justice Sotomayor was about to upset those expectations. Again, this is one of the vignettes I'll be t uh, explaining today as I use it to show why this historic appointee was Sonia Sotomayor, who crossed the barrier and became the very first Hispanic appointed at the court. So as the skits were ending, she springs from her chair. She turns to the law clerks and declares that while their musical parodies were all fine enough, they lacked a certain something. And with that, a law clerk cues salsa music on a small portable player. Now I can tell you that probably never ever in the history of the Supreme Court, more than 200 years old, has salsa music been played and has salsa been danced <laughs> in these very ornate rooms with these very stuffy chief justices lining the wall. She takes a couple steps forward, then back, then turns, then goes forward again. And she had actually taken salsa lessons before she turned 50 as sort of a present to herself. Uh, so she was, she was raring to go. And so we've got these Cuban and Puerto Rican inspired rhythms playing throughout the room in a setting uh, that, as I said, was, is incre incredibly stuffy. First, she starts with the law clerks, who it becomes clear are in on this diversion with her. And then she beckons the justices starting with Chief Justice Roberts. Now, the audience is very apprehensive. By tradition, this is an event where the law clerks prefer, perform and the justices watch. 
But Roberts decides to be a good sport. He gets up and dances with her very briefly. <laughs> then he sits down. And as she searches out partners, nervous colleagues, one by one, dance a bit, then retreat to their chairs. When I talk to various justices in private about this, they recalled like seeing her coming toward her thinking, oh, please, God, not me. And <laughs> but she did. She hit up all of them. Uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy did a little jitterbug uh, style move. Uh, Justice John Paul Stevens, at the time 90 and the eldest, gets up, but he, sa he said he felt like he had two left feet, and he quickly sat down, happy to watch others move around. And then suddenly she shouts, where's Nino? The nickname for Justice Scalia. She shouts toward the back, where he's, he's saying, no way. And um, he's standing there, and he says, he's not going to do it. He's not going to do it. But then she goes back to him, and she gets him to dance, sort of. Um, Justice Samuel Alito, who's very tall and very shy, uh, looked even more awkward as Sotomayor, Justice Sotomayor got to him. He resisted, but in the end, the audience was so into the spectacle that he couldn't, like, at least not get up, you know? So uh, people were standing, laughing, and whooping as she does this. So he gets up and he dances a bit. Then she goes toward Justice Ginsburg, who had endured some of the most difficult days of her life just a few days earlier. And she did not want to rise from her chair. But Sotomayor whispered to her that her late husband, Marty, would have wanted her to dance. So Ginsburg relents and follows Sotomayor in a few steps. Then Justice Ginsburg puts her hands up to Sotomayor's face and holding her two cheeks in her palms, she says, thank you. As the program closed and people began leaving the room, emotions were very high and strong. It had been a difficult term for all. This, by the way, I should mention was the Citizens United term. And Sotomayor's enthusiasm was catching at this moment. Scalia, who could shake things up in his own way, joked as people passed him near the doorway, I knew she'd be trouble. But this was and is Sonia Sotomayor, breaking in and standing out. She'd spent a lifetime challenging the boundaries and disrupting the norm. And the episode at the end of this, the term testify, I believe, to why it was she who was the historic first at the Supreme Court. She was not one to wait her turn. She wasn't going to try this in her second or third term at the court. She tried it her very first term. And if she had waited or held back at other critical junctures in her life, she would probably not have made it to the Supreme Court. And now, once at the court, she believed it should be in her hands to divine her presence. I hope today to show not only how she is a different kind of justice, both on the bench and off. I want to show how she got to this position at the apex of the judiciary. In one of our conversations, she said to me, I stepped into a moment of history. Part of her rise is indeed the result of fortuitous timing. You all know the broad outlines of her life, but let me put it into a little context. She was born in 1954, the year of Brown v. Board of Education, which ended the doctrine of separate but equal and opened schools to blacks and Hispanics. But it was also the year of Hernandez v. Texas, which marked the first time that the Supreme Court held that the Constitution protected Hispanics from the same kind of discrimination that, Blake's, that blacks had faced. It was the first time that the court said that Hispanics could be equally a protected class. Then in the 60s, in the Bronx, where she was growing up. It was the years in which the civil rights movement robustly spread from African Americans to Latino concerns. The year that she entered Princeton, 1972, also happened to be the year that the US Secretary of Labor ordered an increase in the representation of racial and ethnic minorities on campus. In 1978, the year of the Bakke decision, the historic affirmative action decision, that was the year when Justice Sotomayor was at a recruiting dinner at Yale, and a big law firm partner said to her, don't you think you only got here because you were a Hispanic and that you were Puerto Rican? Uh, and that she challenged that, as she goes into detail in her own memoir about. But when she started college, incidentally, only about 10% of all Hispanics between the ages of 18 and 20 were even attending college. So it was, it was remarkable that not only was she attending college, but there she was at Princeton. She was riding a wave of change. The civil rights upheaval of the 60s that she had witnessed in the Bronx had raised awareness among government officials nationwide. They perceived the needs of racial minorities 
as well as the political potential to cultivating a Latino constituency. Let me recall for an example, President Johnson's 1965 speech as he was about to sign the historic executive order implementing affirmative action. Quote, freedom is not enough. You do not take a person who has been hobbled by chains and liberate him and bring him to the starting line and say, okay, now you can run the race. You can be free to compete with others. All citizens, he said, must have the ability to compete. Now, of course, LBJ was talking about African Americans primarily, but that could easily have extended to Hispanics in these years. For her part, Justice Sotomayor worked hard to overcome the deficiencies of her childhood. She got the education and credentials, but she also learned to work the system. And this is where I pick up after her, where her memoir and her personal story ends. And this is what I talk most about in my book, you know, how she made it once she had gotten out of Yale and had her first job. She made a crucial connection to Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, New York's own, in the 1990s. He was the one who secured the federal district court judgeship for her. Now, remember what was going on. We had the Republican administration of George H.W. Bush. But all administrations were trying, administrations at this point, uh, at all levels, uh, um, first President Bush, were trying to become more diverse. And certainly, Senator Moynihan realized that importance. His name had first come to her, him from his screening committee, which had been looking out for uh, more diverse nominees. On paper, she looked very good. Princeton and Yale degrees, a job in the prosecutor's office of the legendary Barb Morgenthau, then now at this time in the early 1990s at Pavia and Harcourt, handling copyright and other int intellectual property issues. Now at age 36, Sotomayor was young for a judgeship, but that didn't bother Moynihan, who had joined the Kennedy administration before his 35th birthday. And her public service credentials with the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund and the New York State Mortgage Board also inspired Moynihan. Equally important, Sonia Sotomayor represented much of his life's work. As a scholar of demographics and a leading but often controversial voice on racial and ethnic policy, Senator Moynihan had been studying ethnic assimilation. He, of course, was co-author of The Melting Pot, that tracked Puerto Ricans as they came to America, as they came to the mainland. He saw her as a highly credentialed individual who knew what it was like to be on society's bottom rungs and had faced disadvantages because of color. He worked hard to get her through the Republican administration of George H.W. Bush. In fact, I have to mention that as he was hounding Justice Department aides and holding up other nominees and trading chits to get her confirmed, uh, including working with Senator, Senator Biden uh, from Syracuse. She, um, he actually was dealing in some ways with a man by the name of John Roberts, who at the time was a deputy solicitor general in the H.W. Bush administration and had interviewed uh, then 30-something, uh, early 30-something Sonia Sotomayor. So they actually crossed paths at an early point in their life, but clearly they were both very driven. Uh, during this time, uh, the Attorney General Dick Thornburg, who was overseeing all of the nomination uh, business to the federal judiciary, had his own frustrations, and he said in a public speech that the process combines the, combines the intricacies of chess with the audacity of old-fashioned hardball. None of this politicking and the way to get through the confirmation process was lost on Sonia Sotomayor. She understood what Moynihan was doing, uh, one of my favorite parts of researching this book was going through the Moynihan papers at the Library of Congress and seeing things that she was faxing to Moynihan aides, giving them material to work with as they tried to move her through the process. Uh, she realized what it took, that there was a, there's a strong degree of politics that are part of the judicial confirmation process. And once she was sworn in as a court, district court judge, she told a conference on women in the judiciary, quote, it's a political appointment people have to make themselves known. You simply do not put in an application. And I have to say, uh, at the time I was writing this, I didn't include this in the book, but Justice O'Connor, back in the 50s and 60s, said almost exactly the same thing, how important it is to make yourself visible. 
Okay, so seven years later, in 1998, when President Clinton tries to elevate Sonia Sotomayor to the Second Circuit, she plays a crucial role again. She learned from Moynihan and others at the time, and this time around, she almost didn't make it through. And maybe she might not have made it without her own, her own role here. The stakes were higher, of course. This time we have a Democratic president making the nomination, so she easily was considered for the appointment from the administration. But Republicans uh, controlled the Senate, and they considered the stakes much higher, which of course they were. She was being considered for a position just below the Supreme Court now on the appeals court. And Justice Stevens, this is 1998, and Justice Stevens was rumored to possibly be ready to step down. Now, as we all know, he didn't step down until 2010, so those rumors were false, but that was constantly in the air. And key Republicans understood that if she were confirmed for the Second Circuit, she would be in line for the Supreme Court. Talk radio host Rush Limbaugh invoked Republican concerns. He stoked those Republican concerns by saying that she was on a rocket ship to the Supreme Court. And the Wall Street Journal editorialized against her and urged then Majority Leader Trent Lott not to give her a vote, saying, we'd like to think that Republicans might be having second thoughts about Judge Sotomayor and are deliberately delaying her confirmation until seeing whether Justice Stevens announces his retirement when the current term ends. And you should all remember that this was a bit in the context of Justice Souter who had been appointed by Republican President George H.W. Bush in 1990 with several pals from New Hampshire, including John Sununu saying, he'll be a home run for the conservatives. Now, of course he wasn't. So, so this is in the backdrop in 1998, uh, even though some Democrats were saying, oh, she's moderate, she's, just look at her rulings on the district court, uh, there's nothing to fear here. Several, people, several Republicans were invo invoking the mantra of uh, no suitors uh, from either party. But what happened, even in the face of uh, a lot of talk radio against her, a lot of you know, the uh, Republican establishment against her, uh, she was actually better prepared to work on this nomination. Her political instincts were sharp and her list of contacts a very long. And in the end, it wouldn't be what the Clinton White House did or what Senate Democrats did, or what even Latino advocates who were pushing her, what they did. Um, it was Republican Senator Alphonse D'Amato who actually made the difference. He engineered the crucial Senate vote for her. And this occurred just a month before the November 1998 election, when he faced Democratic challenger, the first time, um, uh, then U.S. Representative Chuck Schumer for the New York seat, Senate seat. Now, at this point, D'Amato is trailing among Hispanic voters. And Sotomayor and her supporters convince Senator D'Amato that if he can get to Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott and get her a floor vote, Hispanics would be more inclined to vote for him over Schumer. So D'Amato goes and pressures Senator Lott to schedule a vote. And on October 2nd, nearly 16 years to today, the Senate approves Sotomayor's elevation to the Second Circuit. The vote is 67 to 29, and all the votes against her were cast by Republicans. A few weeks later, at her investiture at a Manhattan courthouse, it's clear that she had kept up the networking, even after she had put on the black robe, and she was the one who helpfully engineered the folks who got to Senator D'Amato. She referred to that at her investiture, which again is right before the election in November. And she says how so many people had gone to him, including various local Bronx officials. And she says, quote, State Senator Efren Gonzalez of the 31st District, a man of his word and action, even withheld his endorsement of Senator D'Amato until the senator got that floor vote. Uh, now, just as an aside, I'll say that Senator D'Amato, as most of you know, lost <laughs> the election. Uh, Schumer prevailed and is still uh, your state senator there. Um, but he uh, harbored no hard feelings to towards Sotomayor and in, in 2009, uh, frankly, urged his former colleagues to support her Supreme Court confirmation. Now, I want to address that confirmation here. Remember 2009, it's spring when David Souter, who she ends up succeeding, announces his retirement. At this point, there's only one woman on the Supreme Court, 
Sandra Day O'Connor, our historic first, who was appointed in 1981, uh, named by Ronald Reagan. She had stepped down in January 2006. Her husband was ill with Alzheimer's, and she had said that she wanted to spend more time with him. So all we have on the court right now at this point is our second female justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We also, for the first time, have obviously an African-American president, and everyone is talking about how we have never had a Hispanic justice. And groups who have been pushing for it for years finally start to coalesce. So anyone paying attention to the politics of judicial nominations would have known that President Obama would be inclined toward a woman appointee for an opening on the court and be drawn to the idea of naming the first Hispanic. And Sonia Sotomayor was certainly paying attention. She was her own best agent here. That quality of putting herself forward had been apparent since childhood. She often protested that she was simply going with the flow of national events, but her ambition and drive certainly set her apart. Even in her autobiography, she said at one point, quote, I saw no reason to stint on ambition, unquote, end quote, as once she set her path, herself on a path of a legal career. Uh, even nuns from little old Blessed Sacrament uh, in the Bronx had said her ambition was evident. In the yearbook, uh, one of the nuns wrote, her two goals are, and, and the nun writes something like, her two goals are, surprisingly, to get married and become a lawyer, <laughs> which I thought, you know, kind of an unusual thing for, <laughs> let's squash that right there. But she, she prevailed. Anybody who had low expectations of Sonia Sotomayor, and I certainly will never sell her, settle her short, uh, has been proven wrong. But there she was. She, she, here, the president is looking at a, a field of contenders, and he's, he's not sure what he wants, even though he realizes the great political significance of naming the first Hispanic. And he tells his aides right after elect, the election that, of course, Sonia Sotomayor should be on the list. But he was leaning toward Diane Wood, in fact. She's a judge on the Seventh Circuit. And there was some opposition at the time of this nomination that some of you might remember. Now, it didn't come in the form of the outright racism that Thurgood Marshall faced in 1967 when he became the first African-American nominee. It was much more subtle. Uh, and some of her critics were very well connected to the president. Um, Harvard law professor Larry Tribe, who was a mentor of Barack Obama, wrote, bluntly put, she's not nearly as smart as she seems to think she is. And her reputation for being something of a bully could well make her liberal impulses backfire and simply add to the firepower of the conservative wing. Now, that letter was secret at the time. We didn't know about it until it was released about a year later when somebody had leaked it to the, to the media. But one letter, one sent, set of sentiment that was public at the time came from Jeff Rosen in The New Republic, who wrote a column called The Case Against Sonia Sotomayor. And he said, although competent, Sotomayor's opinions are viewed by former prosecutors as not especially clear or tight and sometimes miss the forest for the trees. And she would say later to students like you, and as you all know, she talks all the time to student groups. She said it was very painful to hear that kind of criticism because she felt like the, the message was, you're just not smart enough. And what she said to audiences, why would that be? Is there a reason other than that I'm a Hispanic? But what she had going for her was, first of all, these terrific credentials. She'd been on federal, lower federal courts for about 17 years. Uh, she had vast networks of people. And she had very distinguished fellow judges on the Second Circuit working for her. Shortly after the election, Judges Guido Calabresi, who she knew uh, when she was at Yale, he was dean then, and Judge Barrington Parker uh, set up a meeting with uh, then White House counsel Greg Craig. And they wanted to let him know several things of interest from their circuit, but they also wanted to let him know about her. And they wanted to head off any kind of criticism that she was too bullying. Uh, Judge Calabresi told me that he actually tracked her questions to see if they were truly different from the questions that male judges were asking. And he said that he was ready to cite chapter and verse about the nature of her questions and how they truly were 
along the lines of what he was asking. And he felt that what he wanted to communicate to then White House counsel Greg Craig is that there's a good degree of sexism at the heart of this, this kind of complaint. Um, but certainly those kinds of complaints were out there. It wasn't just Larry Tribe. It wasn't just Jeff Rosen. Uh, many of you are probably f familiar with the Almanac of the Federal Judiciary, a very respected compilation of lawyers' views. And through the years, um, there were plenty of practitioners in the Second Circuit who uh, referred to her as quite aggressive, quite pushy, quite stubborn, quite all sorts of things that sometimes maybe could be associated with um, with a woman that somebody didn't like, but also could generally be associated with, with maybe a judge who didn't have the kind of judicial demeanor. So that became an issue, and uh, Judge Calabresi in particular wanted to head that off. And not only was he willing to talk to the administration about that, once she was nominated, he went public. He talked to reporters. He was willing to be quoted by name. And that certainly performed a service for her. Uh, she also did lots of homework. This is the kind of woman who d tries not to leave any stone unturned. Before her meeting with President Obama, and she was one of, I think it was five or six nominees who actually got an audience with the president, and she was the one who had never met Barack Obama before. She went back and looked at confirmation hearings tapes. She wanted to know what kinds of questions would naturally come up. She talked to lots of people. She got good advice. And she said that that was one of the best interviews ever, if not the best second only to the one she had with Senator Moynihan when he put her up for the um, first spot as a district court judgeship. So in the end, many factors made a difference. But face it, it was the first time that Hispanic advocates themselves uh, were ready to rally around a single nominee. Uh, in my book, you'll see that I look at the, um, the chances that Jose Cabranes on the Sixth Circuit might have had at one point, and the chances that Miguel Estrada, uh, a very strong, smart, highly credentialed lawyer who was put up for the DC Circuit by President, the second President Bush, might have had himself. But by 2009, just think of the demographics, Hispanics represented 16% of the, Hisp the U.S. population. And um, during the 2000s, uh, the, the Hispanic population had grown four times faster than the overall U.S. population. So certainly Barack Obama had an incentive to name a Hispanic for all sorts of right reasons and for additional political reasons. And uh, it, it was as if you know, her time had come, but it wasn't. It wasn't a done deal. And I do have to say, once the president did it, I have this scene uh, toward the end of that chapter where, he's, uh, where he runs into a, a, a highly respected political uh, aide, Ron Klain, and he's been tossing around the football, kind of feeling like he's just trying to work out some stress, and he was anxious about the appointment in some ways. But after he sees this great outpouring, and everyone suddenly wants to be a wise Latina, he says, to Ron Klain, I feel really good about this. And he felt so good about it that he actually used it in one of his 2012 political uh, commercials uh, in a campaign video, flashes back to that moment uh, of her appointment. So now she's on the bench. Uh, and we're going into her fifth year. Uh, just remember, just think, uh, before her historic appointment, a total of 110 justices had been named to the Supreme Court. She was the 111th. And all but four of those justices appointed before her uh, since the creation of the court in 1789 were white men, reflecting the traditional power base of this nation. Uh, beginning with African-American Thurgood Marshall in 67, these groundbreakers navigated the court in different ways, faced the public, dif public expectations differently, and also navigated the private rituals among the justices um, in different ways. Thurgood Marshall and Ruth Bader Ginsburg remain advocates in many ways for their constituencies. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor and Clarence Thomas, our second Af African American justice, resisted being defined by their sex and race. And they also handled differently the public expectations on them of someone who's different. None of these predecessors as groundbreakers have been, were as publicly candid as Sotomayor about the role, about being different. The way she presents herself now, intimately, relentlessly, sets her apart from all the others. Uh, Justice O'Connor and Justice Thomas wrote memoirs, but they had been on the bench you know, 15, 20 years before they penned their memoirs. Justice Sotomayor actually signed the contract 
and had been had been looking for an agent and signed the contract even before that ended term party that I described at the beginning of this session. Um, so she, uh, as you've noticed, commentators have begun to call her the people's justice, but I do have to note that her style and all the attention she gets doesn't always suit the other justices or the legal elite in their orbit. And she knows she stands out. She accepts it, embraces it as part of her individuality, and what she has called, quote, a lifetime commitment to identifying myself as a Puerto Rican Hispanic. In 2010, just after that moment, um, the salsa moment at the Supreme Court, she happened to be speaking to students in Denver, and there were um, a range of students. There were law students, there were high school students, and she said, the point is that I was different. It took a lot of hard work to make a life. At, and she was referring to make a life at Princeton and then at Yale. And then a young woman asked her from the audience whether she ever felt completely comfortable being in these different atmospheres. And she pauses for a second and then she says, do you ever, when you're that different? So she's, she's defining herself by her difference, but she's also not being as much of an advocate as, for example, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who argued before the Supreme Court on behalf of women's rights did, or as Thurgood Marshall, who founded the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, did. Um, so she, and I asked her about that, and she said, I'm not a flamethrower. It's not that the passion isn't there. It's that it's always been done in a lawyerly, judicial way. She doesn't want to stand out as an advocate. She wants to more be an advocate for herself and to connect with people more as a role model. Still, she has made her mark in a way that I believe traces to her background and interest in the poor, the disenfranchised, and minorities. And I just want to take a few seconds at the end here to talk about what she has done on the court. She has sought fairer procedures for criminal defendants, and her writings reflect the knowledge not just of being a Latina, but also being a big city prosecutor in Manhattan. In her early term, she distinguished herself as, as she dissented from the denial of um, uh, prisoner appeals. As many of you know, individual justices rarely go public to dissent from a denial of a cert petition, but she has done that many times. She's made a name for herself there. And also, I have to say, even though as a body of work, her opinions so far have lacked rhetorical fire, real passion, and they've been pretty straightforward, workmanlike, as they were on the Second Circuit, she has become a robust voice on race. And when the court faced a pivotal case on affirmative action in 2013, her willingness to write a scorching opinion led the majority to alter its course. And I'm speaking of the University of Texas affirmative action case that initially was brought because of Abigail Fisher, a young white student who had been rejected to the flagship campus in Austin and ended up going to LSU instead. In the course of my reporting, I discovered that behind the scenes, Justice Sotomayor had written a dissent from the majority, of, the original majority opinion in that case. And through an unusually long nine-month set of negotiations over this case, the justices went from rejecting outright the University of Texas program to an opinion that allowed it to stand for now and allowed affirmative action nationwide on campuses to stand, but yet sent the case back for further review. And for those of you who have been following that case, the Fifth Circuit in Austin um, recently upheld the Texas policy. But this tense debate that I discovered occurred, occurred behind the scenes. And when it was over, there was no public sign of what Sotomayor had wrought. In fact, she ended up signing the opinion of uh, uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy, who wrote for the majority. Only Justice Ginsburg dissented, saying, no, this should not be sent back. But we did see shades of what she wrote behind the scenes in that University of Texas opinion just this year in April in the uh, Schutte affirmative action case from Michigan. As some of you probably remember, uh, we had the 2003 Grutter decision that involved the University of Michigan affirmative action program uh, through an opinion by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. The law school admissions policy that considered race was upheld. Uh, voters in Michigan decided then to go to the ballot box and uh, approve a ban on affirmative action in state policies, including in higher education. So now we're back at the court in 2014, and what's before the justices isn't higher education affirmative action, so to speak, but rather this ban in Michigan and whether that should stand. And the justices 
vote with the, uh, the majority says, yes, Michigan voters had the authority to, to do that. Only Justice Sotomayor and Justice Ginsburg dissent at this point to that opinion. And Justice Sotomayor picks up the pen and she writes an opinion that has lots of strands from what she had penned in the University of Texas case until it actually made a difference. This time, she ended up in dissent and she went public. And she felt deeply that uh, special measures uh, were sp still needed uh, to lift black and other minorities. And first of all, she actually wanted to try to change the rhetoric a little bit. And instead of referring to affirmative action, she referred to race sensitive admissions policies rather than preferences. Um, and she thought the court, in that opinion, upholding the Michigan ban, was evading the dilemma of race in America and the reality that she knew well and that, that people were still judged by the color of their skin. And I have to say that one of the lines, several of the lines from that dissent, echo what she says when she goes into, and does speeches. Here's one of them. Race matters. Because of the slights, the snickers, the silent judgments, that have the effect of crippling, of, of this kind of crippling thought. I do not belong here. And to me, not only was she speaking publicly about the problem with not having, um, not confronting the issue of race, she was reminding people of how she still feels, that you can still feel that you do not belong there just because somebody will be, uh, primarily because somebody will be looking at you based on color. Now, the chief, really didn't like what she said in that regard, that very personal statement. He also didn't like how she and Scalia went at it in part of the opinion and wrote a separate concurrence himself to talk about how he didn't think it helped either side to have this kind of airing in public. Um, and the fact is that they will talk privately about how she thinks they think that maybe she talks too much from the bench and that she has set herself as, uh, apart from the others uh, in, in sort of a, a little bit bolder public way than might, uh, they might find to be appropriate with all the speaking that she does off the bench. So this can't help but raise the question that I end the book with, is how effective this luminary in American life will be for the law of the land. She has defined herself as being different, certainly, and as she occupies this third floor suite at the court, she also has a bit of a separate floor mentality as she operates in her own world she set herself apart even from the other liberals on the bench with some of her uh, separate opinions, opinions that Justice Kagan, her fellow appointee of President Obama, has not done. Uh, but I think we're going to see more of those solo dissenting and concurring opinions, which I think, frankly, will, um, will help illuminate matters uh, not just for minorities, but people who are more on the left. Right now, she, might, she arguably is our uh, most liberal justice. Certainly not in the mold of uh, Thurgood Marshall and William Brennan, but um, more liberal than this court has seen for a while. So she's been effective at setting herself apart, and she's, she's been uh, breaking away to make uncomfortable assertions, whether on the possible injustice of uh, shielding corporations from claims to human rights, which we saw in the uh, Daimler case, uh, or as she also has said uh, in an Alabama case where judges were swayed potentially could have been swayed by politics and their death penalty decisions. But I would say that whatever her legacy in the marble confines of the Supreme Court, it seems bound to be eclipsed by her more public role. Her timing has been stunning. At every stage, at every turn, she was ready for an America that was ready for her. Uh, she arrived on the national scene and at the very top of the US judiciary as Hispanics increasingly were visible in all facets of life. Just think of New Year's Eve. She was the one who dropped, pushed the button to drop the ball on, uh, on Times Square. It's not that she's been breaking barriers as a Puerto Rican, she's breaking barriers now as a justice. So I'm gonna return now uh, to that salsa incident and to say that I discovered that as surprising as it was at that first end of term party, some justices have told me that it now seems to reflect the core of her character, it's really of a piece. She shakes up proceedings and confronts her colleagues in their private conferences on cases. And what I have to say is, when she asked them to dance, they did. On the law, they might be less likely to follow. Thank you very much.
And I, I realize that I actually, you're all, what do you have, like three minutes? <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> They, they're all trying to get to lunch, yes, but uh, in class. Yes. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, I just have a question for you as a Supreme Court reporter in general. Sure. What do you think the likelihood that the court will grant one of the first round marriage equality petitions from the conferences, or do you think they'll be relisted? That's a great question, and if I was going to ask answer any question, that's so wonderfully timely. Thank you. Okay, they've got several petitions pending from Utah, from Virginia, from Oklahoma. We probably will see, uh, and we've got the Wisconsin, the Wisconsin and Indiana ones now, and we'll probably see something from the Sixth Circuit. I think it's very likely that they will um, grant something. I don't think they'll do it at the first conference just because they have so many other things to look at and they, they're um, sort of risk averse about prematurely granting cert if there's some flaws in the case. And remember, they haven't been together yet. They won't be together until um, actually next Monday. So what I think will happen, and you know, hey, they can surprise all of us, is I think they'll end up granting. I think they'll take a uh, one or two. I don't think they'll just take one case, and I don't think they'll take all. I think they'll take a nice representative sample. I think maybe we'll know as soon as mid-October. This is all just completely speculative. Um, Justice Ginsburg recently referred to the fact that there's no split in the circuits. But this is of such national importance. And even though there's not a split, we might get one with the Sixth Circuit or the Fifth, there are lots of people whose lives are in li legal limbo because some marriages did take place in these states that have bans. And the question is, how effective are those marriage licenses? So I think there will be an imperative for the justices to step in, uh, not immediately, but this term. We'll see. Thank you. Uh, hi. hi. Um, the common perception of the Supreme Court right now, I think, is that it's characterized by a lot of 5-4 splits mm -hmm. um, along partisan lines, uh, at least the partisan lines of the presidents who appointed them. Right. Um, is this accurate? And what is the, the explanation for this? Is it like just simple like partisan politics taking place in the Supreme Court? Is it like something like core values and forming legal decisions that just happen to end up in this partisan way? Um, what would you say is the best explanation for that, and is that perception accurate? I'm so glad you added that part about is the perception uh, accurate, because the truth is that most of the opinions don't come down to 5-4. A small majority do, but they happen to be the ones we're all following. Uh, so the justices primarily, you know, many times we had, like the cell phone case, that means that um, if you're stopped, the police can't confiscate your smartphone without a warrant. Uh, that was 9-zip. The uh, very important um, NLRB Noel Canning case, one level, it was 9-zip also. So, but then they, bro they split on the rationale 5-4. And I think that's a very telling case because in many ways, Chief Justice Roberts really tries to get them unanimous or close to unanimous on narrow grounds. That's his priority. But then face it, this is a polarized court. So when it comes down to things that really might matter in the law or might matter in society, like same-sex marriage, then it is 5-4. What informs that? I would say that's, that it's uh, their own views of the law, their own ide ideologies, in addition to politics in some way, and many other factors that are woven together. So um, your question's on point, and I think we'll continue to see the chief try to find common ground, but I think inevitably, with the nine that we have, we're going to see that. And I, I think it's likely that what if and when they take up same-sex marriage, that would be 5-4, just like what we saw with the Windsor ruling uh, in June of 2013. Is that, okay. Thank you all. Thanks. <laughs>